Madhav, and welcome as we talk about translating the past and reclaiming traditions with Dr. Shobana Xavier as part of the College Program on Islam mini-series that's taking place. For those of you who don't know, my name is Mina Nayak and I have served as the Program Director for CPOI for the last couple of years and am the organizer of this series. The College Program on Islam began in summer of 2002 for Shia Ismaili Muslim youth the founding program directors responded to the concern of these young Ismailis about how to articulate what it means to be Muslim in the United States. Seeking to fill a gap that exists across education at universities and colleges on Islamic studies, CPOI became a place where Ismaili college students across the United States were able to access rigorous academic study and explore what it means to be Muslim and Ismaili. The overall goals of CPOI have and continue to focus on enabling students to navigate the beauty and challenges in which they are likely to find themselves, living in an environment where one is constantly responding to and working through multiple overlapping contexts, some of which may include Shia, Ismaili, American, immigrant, first generation, and a variety of socioeconomic backgrounds. To increase students' capacity to confidently articulate their identity, CPOI also hopes to encourage and empower students to think about how to actualize the ethical underpinnings of living Islam. Responding to the ongoing global pandemic, the 2020 CPOI program, which would have normally been residential, moved online. That set the foundation for us to bring you this special presentation, which will focus on demystifying ideas of Orientalism and the exoticism that have embattled our faith and cultures with attention focused on the roots and implications of this othering and the erasure of Eastern contributions to Western modernity in the United States. This is meant to provide a taste of what students who attend CPOI will actually go through and some of the content that they experience. These presentations are meant to be a place to start and make sense of the complexities of being Muslim in the United States. And we encourage you to use this as a first step, especially recognizing that these sessions are not exhaustive in the content that they cover, but are simply opportunities to enter into this learning. And with that, I am excited to present today's session, Translating the Past and Reclaiming Traditions. This session will focus on exploring the realities of transmitting and translating aspects of faith into new contexts, particularly with a look at how Sufism translates to the modern West and exists within the Ummah. When do we start to see our heritage being taken? When is it valued or erased? And how do we define our traditions and the transmission that we attribute to faith versus culture, for example? What happens when the fluidity of time, space, and location actually take over? Dr. Shobana Xavier is here to discuss this with us. She currently serves as, as an assistant professor with the School of Religion at Queen's University and, in, and engages in research areas focused around contemporary Sufism in North America and South Asia and explores how these are transformed and transmitted to new regions via diasporas, literature, migration, and popular culture. Dr. Xavier is the author of two books and is also working on two book projects concurrently. We are so excited to have her expertise and time to look, look into this topic with us. Thank you so much and thank you to Farhana um, for this invitation and this opportunity to be with you all today. I'm, I'm really appreciative. Um, what I'm going to do is share my screen because I have some images. I hope this works. Um, and Mina, maybe you could let me know that you're seeing uh, the proper yes. slides. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so once again, thank you to the organizers, to Mina and Farhana for this opportunity to be with you all today. I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, as we begin tonight, I also want to um, do a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm joining you from uh, Southern Ontario, um, so kind of closer to, to Toronto for those of you um, who don't, don't know. Um, and so I want to recognize the, the, the communities and the indigenous peoples that have been caretakers of this land. Uh, 
for such a long time and I also acknowledge my my place as a settler here. Um, I think for a lot of us who are going through COVID, we've come to really connect with the land and turn to the land in these moments to, to find um, reprieve from really kind of a stressful time. And so in these moments of being with the land and tree and nature and waters, it's, it's kind of also recognizing the peoples who have taken care of it for uh, so many generations um, who continue to experience violence today. Um, and so in Kingston, where I'm based, um, it's the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, if you don't know who the um, indigenous peoples of your lands are, I'd encourage you to take a look um, and in your own way offer gratitude and, and peace um, when, when you have a moment, because um, I think that's important. Um, and so, and I think especially when we're having conversations about um, um, when we're having conversations about Islam and Sufism in the Canadian context or the North American context of the United States and Canada, where I look at, I think recognizing the role of you know, settlers coming in, recognizing the histories that existed before settlers came in is an important one. So what I'll do is generally, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the, the history of Sufism in the North American context, but I'm gonna take us a little back in historical context to the Orientalist period, because I think so much of what we understand to be Sufism has been really influenced by um, encounters uh, by Europeans under colonial and imperial context. And that kind of uh, encounter resulted in a particular imagination of Sufis. And that is then what resulted in kind of this you know, set of waves that um, has informed how we think about Sufism today. So I'll do a little bit of a um, introduction on that. And then I'll shift us to thinking about some of the things that have informed the development of Sufism in the, in the North American context, some of the teachers that came, some migration patterns, but also popular spirituality. Um, and hopefully we have enough time. I'm going to end off on two kind of case studies. One is more about sacred spaces that I look at. And the other one is on Rumi, which I think a lot of people are really interested in. And I think some of you also were interested in, in terms of Dr. Curtis's talk, if you attended last night, in terms of questions of cultural appropriation, um, which is something that I, I work on. Um, so that's a bit of an outline. Um, and I will also tie that into the Ismaili community in Toronto, which um, a, in a project that I'm working on. Um, so that's our plan. Um, let's see. So in terms of Orientalism and Sufism, I think one of the things or the main points that I would encourage people to take away is that the idea of Sufism, even the name itself, right, we say Sufism, um, is a name that's been constructed by European Orientalists. It is a name and a label that has been given by outsiders, so non-Muslims, to this practice that people had encountered. And a lot of this encounter was based on kind of travelers, um, and um, Europeans who were working, let's say, for the British East India Company in, in India or in parts of what we consider the Middle East. And in their journeys and in their travels, they had come to encounter kind of these figures that they thought were really mystical and exotic and alluring, right? And we see this in terms of pictures they painted. We see this in terms of diaries that, had, that they have kept that historians have come to encounter. And, and when we look at these images, you start realizing that there really was kind of this, you know, almost obsession with these figures that were so elusive. And because of this obsession, people, you know, over time really got focused on thinking about these individuals. Um, and you realize that it was kind of the dervish mendicant figure, the image that you see here, who was seen as so um, antithetical to Islam, which they, you know, associated with uh, backwardness, with uh, barbarity, right? This notion of uh, a regressive civilization, whereas these figures, these elusive figures, these aesthetic figures were positioned as individuals that were perhaps different, right? And so this is kind of really one of the earliest moments that you start realizing kind of this, this untethering or separation of an idea of Sufism, a label that European colonizers um, kind of constructed and attributed to these figures and the separation that maybe Islam was not the tradition from which this tradition actually uh, developed from, but rather was something just happened to have encountered because it, you know, maybe has genesis in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Greek uh, traditions, right? So this is kind of one of the earliest instances when you go back to these practices, uh, these texts, you start kind of seeing these examples. You see these in paintings, particularly, and, and one of the things that you see in kind of Orientalist paintings, particularly, is the whirling dervish. Um, so if some of you have encountered the whirling dervish, uh, maybe you've gone to Turkey or you've seen them in images 
images on social media or in movies or documentaries, you know, there's this kind of presentation of the whirling dervish with the long hat, which symbolizes a tomb, and the long flowing skirt, the tenere, um, and the turning, right? So again, this is one of the, the quintessential uh, image that travelers, European travelers, non-Muslim travelers, who are perhaps going to the Ottoman Empire or to other Muslim regions, when they encountered this, they were so enamored by it, right? And so they started painting, they started writing about it, and we still have, have a lot of these paintings going back to the, the 19th century to the 20th century. And so when you start looking at these images, you realize that this is what they were really fascinated with. And this is what they started thinking about as Sufism. Um, and you have a lot of attention, you know, uh, given to the actual whirling and the tradition of Sufis as dervishes, but particularly turning dervishes, whirling dervishes, right? There's, there's focus on the music, there's focus on the attire, there's focus on ritual, right? The idea of these individuals who are whirling as in a dizzying frenzy that, right, that again, it was something Something that was so exotic, so different, and no way had anything to do with Islam, right? And so this kind of moment, even though this is just a very brief example, is really kind of sets up our perception or the way in which Sufism continues to be treated as it starts spreading out of Muslim majority regions into the global West. So as it goes to places like uh, Western Europe and as it goes into places like America. Right. This is what's in people's imaginations because those who are not able to travel, they get their hands on these paintings or they get ha their hands on these travel logs and they read them and it really um, influences their imagination. It also influences the work that they themselves start producing. So this influence of not only the representations of Sufis or dervish, dervishes and also the poetry that these Europeans were coming to encounter, such as that of Hafez of Rumi, of Saadi, of Omar Khayyam, right, these individuals, um, and they were encountering them primarily because a lot of Europeans were studying the languages. They were studying languages like Sanskrit, they were studying languages like Persian. They weren't always so interested in learning Arabic, right, because again, they associated Arabic with something that was part of a tradition of Islam, part of the tradition of the Quran, and so not as exciting, but they were interested in Persian because that ended up being perhaps the language that they were using for some of their administrative work as they were controlling these new regions. And so their encounter of Sufi poetry as something that was quite Persian and not Arabic also influenced the way that they thought of Sufism as something that was quintessentially non-Islamic, right? Because they didn't encounter it in Arabic. So as you know, these snippets of uh, translations of Hafez primarily and Saudi and Rumi not so much, but you know, it was primarily Omar Khayyam and um, Hafez that was beginning to be translated. Um, it starts spreading, right? It, it starts traveling. We talk about literature having kind of a life on its own. So it goes to places like Western Europe, it also crosses the Atlantic Ocean and goes to places like America and, and others who've never left you know, the, their own homeland and never traveled to the supposed Middle East or the supposed Orient. They read this poetry, they encounter these paintings and they themselves are transformed. And that also influences their perception of what Sufism is, right? So before anybody really is meeting Sufis and understanding them, there's a, a collective imagination of Sufism that's forming, namely through literary culture. Um, and so, you know, this is influencing people that are coming out of um, the romantic tradition. So poets and writers, people are writing poems, um, you know, um, and influencing their ideas. And you particularly see this in the context of American transcendentalists. So Ralph Waldo Emerson, that many people will know readily as someone who's representative of the kind of, you know, philosophical and spiritual movement that's emerging in, in America in the 19th you know, 19th century, who many of you may have studied in, you know, your schooling, in your curriculum in the U.S., um, was reading Hafez, right? I mean, his, some of his final entries before he died, one of the poets that he mentors, mentions as someone who has had a um, deep influence on him, both spiritually but also poetically, is actually Hafez. He rates him quite high with other poets, right? So again, you start to realize that the poetry of Sufism, and uh, this idea of Sufism as something that's separate from Islam is already influencing so many movements such as European romantics, the poetic traditions there, philosophical thinking, and individuals like um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who are participating in kind of an American literary 
um, renaissance in, in the American context. And of course, it then goes on to influence um, um, Emerson's own students like Walt Whitman. So one of the things, for instance, that I do and some other scholars do is they kind of compare poetry, right? So if you go through some poetry by Walt Whitman, who is a student of Emerson, for instance, and you see some of the themes and ideas and styles uh, of this poet, and then you compare it to poems as, such as Hafez, such as Rumi, you start noticing particular patterns and tendencies. And if you start putting them side by side, you start thinking, oh, you know, this idea is something that I also saw in a Rumi poetry. And Whitman is also playing with it in his own poetry in an American context in the English language, right? And so this is one way to kind of think, think about how Sufism is coming to exist in Western contexts. Again, here I'm talking about places in Western Europe, such as um, England, such as France, but also into the American context, because so much of what was happening in America in terms of the literary scene, but also the religious and spiritual and intellectual scene, it, there's a lot of sharing and there's a lot of networks across the Atlantic Ocean, right? And you really see this kind of deep ex uh, example with figures like Emerson, with Walt Whitman, um, T.S. Eliot, right? A lot of uh, scholars and poets and writers that we think are quintessentially American, if you kind of go to their bibliography, you realize that they were citing um, Sufi poets and they were citing them as these individuals who had universal appreciation of love. Um, they didn't really particularly think of them as Muslim, they thought of them as dervishes or they thought of them as Sufi, right? And so this was something that was quite different from what they imagined to be Islam, which they um, understood and was popular at the time, the understanding that Islam was dry, it was legalistic, that the Prophet Muhammad was everything that Jesus was not, right? So this kind of separation of Sufism and Islam is really, really important. And I think is an important context that helps us understand what's happening in our contemporary climate. And so this notion of Sufism as universal, as non-Islamic is one important th thread that emerges in the literary culture. Um, another one that starts emerging or is present in the American context, and this is something that Dr. Curtis would have spoken to you at length about yesterday, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, is that if we understand some of the first Muslims to have come to America um, were enslaved peoples who were forcibly brought here um, under servitude and enslavement were Muslims, then we also have to recognize that some of these Muslims would have had an understanding of Islam that was based on Sufism. And so scholars like Sylvian Daouf and other scholars like Dr. Curtis, um, they understand then that some of the Islam that was um, being practiced under secrecy, right, because in these individuals who are enslaved, um, would have been a form of Sufism that was tied to particular regions in the African continent, right, particularly West Africa. And so one figure that scholars have recently found some very exciting work on is um, the figure by the name of, name of Omar Ibn Said. Um, Said had an autobiography and um, Carl Ernst, who's a scholar at UNC Chapel Hill, has recently done some scholarship and analysis on his um, autobiography and has actually seen references to some Sufi scholars such as Ibn al-Arabi. And so it's really exciting to think about the fact that we have, you know, um, individuals who are the first Muslims in the North American context, in the United States context, who we know were Muslims, whose stories have been purged from, you know, the American history that we like to tell ourselves, um, who are, you know, referencing things like Sufism and Sufi scholars and their writings that they have left behind. So this is another important thread. And um, this is not a thread that would be sustained, but this is indeed a story um, that is important to remember, right? And why this is important to remember is that um, as um, Islam becomes um, an identity and a form of resistance with race-based movements, such as with Nation of Islam, the Moorish Science Temple, and other Black Muslims in the 60s and 70s, one of the things that they would gravitate towards would also be this understanding of Sufism that is tied to continental Africa, especially as there's a lot of movement going back and forth. For instance, we know that Malcolm X traveled to, to Africa. And one of the questions that scholars often ask about individuals who study Malcolm X is to know if Malcolm X had any Sufi connections. And, and to date, we actually don't know if he does or does not, right? Because there isn't any evidence for it. There's often a lot of speculation. So there's also this important thread that with the African-American community due to the history of their ancestors in America, but also to broader 
movements that were established um, during the 60s and 70s as a result of the civil rights movement with Islam. Uh, one of the threats that also influenced this would have been Sufism to some extent. Um, when scholars do talk about Sufism in North America, they'd start with the figure though of someone named Hazrat Dunya Khan. Um, and so most scholars, if you were to ask them, you know, when did Sufism begin in the American context, they would say, well, it began the moment that Hazrat Dunya Khan came to, to America in the early 1900s. He got on a ship in, you know, um, in Gujarat. He got on a ship with his cousins and his brothers as part of a musical trope. They were musicians and they got off of Ellis Island in New York. Um, and that was the first instance that we have uh, an example of a teacher, an actual Sufi teacher who came to America with the intention of disseminating or sharing the teachings of Sufism. And he did it primarily through the sharing of Indian classical music. Um, and so this tradition would be very, very important and is a tradition that continues to exist today. And so Inayat Khan's tradition and the Sufi order that he created, both in the American context, but he would then leave and go to London and then he established himself in, in, in Switzerland. Um, he, he would be one of the first figures to really establish Sufism, not in the American context only, but also in Western Europe. What was interesting or un unfortunate was that he died quite young. He died in 1927, kind of unexpectedly, and he died when he went back to New Delhi to visit. And so Hazrat Nia Khan is actually entombed in, in New Delhi. And for those of you who might have traveled to New Delhi, he's actually just entombed, you know, quite just literally in the same neighborhood as Nizamuddin Aulia, so the uh, Nizamuddin Aulia's bust. Um, and it's just behind. And so it's kind of interested, interesting to think that a teacher who came to America and has mainly an American following and also uh, a European following is interred and buried in India and a lot of his pilgrims from America and Europe traveled to India quite regularly to go pay um, respect, especially on his death anniversary. So after Hazrat Inayat Khan died in 1927, there wasn't much in terms of um, teachers who are coming and going, at least not in like a systematic way. So we kind of have these loose threads, right? The thread of the po poetic traditions that was influencing some movements. We have the thread of African-American Islam and some who are engaging with Sufism. And you have the thread in the early 20th century of Hazrat Inayat Khan who came um, and then he left, right? And so till about 1960s, um, there's nothing quite sustained that's happening beyond some small movements. Um, but the 1960s really changed everything in terms of Sufism in America. And so some of you might know of kind of the spiritual and countercultural um, shifts of the 1960s. Some of you may have lived through it, um, I'm not sure. But you know, this is a period in the 1960s and 70s where we're talking about the civil rights movement, you know, the feminism movement, the um, anti-war movement. A lot of people are leaving their churches and they're leaving their synagogue and they're really interested in the spiritualities and traditions of the East, right? So they're turning to yoga or they're trying out new religious movements that some people are worried are cults and that need to be, you know, saved, right? And, you know, so you have figures like Osho, you have figures that are turning to, to Buddhism or you have the um, Sikhism, right? So this is kind of a really important moment in the development of Sufism in North America, primarily because this is a moment in which there's a lot of interest, right? Not only in Sufi traditions, but also in other religious traditions. And again, a very Orientalist understanding that the East has something to offer us and the East has spirituality to offer us. And we, as those who are located in the West, um, want to extract that spirituality. So you have a lot of teachers who are coming to the American context. And this is really the period um, that Sufi teachers also start coming to the American context. And there are so many Sufi teachers that I'm not able to go through all of them, but I'll uh, point to some. So uh, one teacher that I've studied a lot about um, is uh, Bawa Muhaydin. So he came from Sri Lanka, he came to Philadelphia in 1971 and set up uh, a community center there. Um, and I'll come back to him a little bit. He died in 1986. So his community is mainly based in Philadelphia. Um, and he attracted mainly African-American followers, but over time in the 80s started attracting a lot of non-Muslims, right? Uh, uh, white people, right? From Jewish traditions, from Christian traditions who were interested in spirituality. 
Um, you have teachers coming from places like Turkey. So Muzaffar Ozak is another individual who also had students who were uh, um, non-Muslims. And so one of the interesting things about this moment is that a lot of the uh, teachers who came from Muslim backgrounds themselves were attracting students who were not Muslims. And so there's this kind of, again, this question of is Sufism universal? And if so, can one be a Sufi without practicing Islam, right? And these teachers made the decision that they could, right? And this kind of creates um, some tension, right? Um, if you don't have to be a Muslim and you are a Sufi, then, you know, well, what is Sufism? Is Sufism not an Islamic tradition, right? And so there's some kind of interesting conversations that are taking place here. And I could kind of go into it a little bit more in the Q&A. But this is the moment in which really, again, like when Hazrat Inayat Khan came, the initial interest is from Americans, Americans who are not Muslims. They're interested in Sufism as a spiritual practice and they find attraction to it maybe because of music, maybe because of the universalism, maybe because of Rumi, maybe because of the opportunity to practice swirling. So as more and more teachers came, this really then sets up kind of the landscape of Sufism in North American context. If you do kind of a quick survey of Sufi teachers now in North America, and this is not even the entirety of it, these are just a handful of people. Um, most Sufi teachers in North America come from, you know, are either white or they may be Muslims and come from kind of um, uh, Muslim majority backgrounds so have an ethnicity that ties them also culturally to Islam, right? So there's a lot of identity politics here. Again, and this question of who is a Sufi? Who gets to be a Sufi? Um, uh, who is an authentic Sufi, right? And I think that's also an important question. And there's this kind of sense that maybe if you're American and maybe if you're not Muslim um, and you practice Sufism, maybe you're not really, really a Sufi, right? Maybe there's no legitimacy. But what's fascinating is that if you look at all of these pictures, you know, most people I think will look at kind of the racial composition of some of these Sufi teachers and you realize that some are white, some are not white, some are women, some are not women, right? So when you think of Sufism in North America in this present moment, I would really encourage um, you to think about in terms of kind of really a deep diversity and across gender, across racial identity and across religious identity. So I'm saying also Muslims and non-Muslims. I think this is a little bit tricky for some people to absorb. Um, and so this is a really quick kind of introduction to some of the, the trends and how Sufism came to um, the American context. So it's both a mix of um, diasporic transplantation, so people who came from Muslim majority contexts, but also the encounter of um, you know, non-Muslim Americans who encountered these teachers who then themselves became Sufis all the time. So there's just such a long deep history and it's a really complex history, right? Um, and one of the things I kind of want to end off is kind of thinking about what this means, what this diversity means. Because I think this history and this um, diversity of history has resulted in different expressions of Sufism in the United States. Um, it may mean that we have sacred spaces like a Mazar that maybe some of you have encountered in, in South Asia, in Central Asia, and you know, in East Africa. It's very common to have Sufi shrines to Sufi saints. Um, you may not think that that exists in the, in the American context, but it does. So that kind of practice and expression of Sufism that we associate with our kind of homelands um, actually also have transplanted and now continue to exist in North America. At the same time, I think we have kind of uh, a reality of Sufism, which is really tied to popular spirituality, maybe even what some people would call new age movement. And I think there's a, a lot of diversity in that spectrum. And so sometimes it's hard to reconcile such different diversity. And sometimes it's also hard to think about, well, what is Sufism, right, at the end of the day? You know, if Rumi's on popular media versus there's a Sufi shrine where people are making pilgrimages to. So I wanna give you some of those images. So hopefully that will spark some thought, but also some kind of questions, provoke some questions. Um, so the first one is sacred spaces. Um, so Bao Muhaideen, who I introduced a little bit earlier as the Sufi teacher who came from the Sri Lankan context, when he died in 1986, he was actually interred in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Um, so this is Amish farm country. This is about an hour west of, from Philadelphia. So if, you're, if you ever end up going, you'll be passing through Amish a country, Mennonite country, there'll be hose, um, horses and buggies. Um, and then you kind of you know, go up and down rolling hills and you end up to this place that kind of looks like 
something you might see in India or maybe even the Taj Mahal because it actually was inspired by the architectural design of the Taj Mahal. So one of the interesting things about the American context and Sufism having been kind of transplanted and having existed here for well over um, a century is that Sufi expressions are a reality here. And some of that is spatial, right? So Bawa Muhaideen is buried in 86 and they started, they built a shrine for him. And no one, you know, most of his American followers built the shrine and really didn't anticipate anything. And come the 1990s, Muslims in Jer New Jersey, Muslims in the Eastern seaboard learned that there's a Sufi shrine and just two hours away from them that they didn't have to make pilgrimage or ziyara to, um, you know, to go to Pakistan or to India, to Ajmer, to go give uh, respect to their Sufi teacher. They could actually do that in Coatesville, get in the car and just drive two hours, right? And so this has become a reality now. So it actually started as something that was a bunch of Americans who got together, who wanted to build something to honor their teacher. All of a sudden in the 1990s, um, American Muslims who, are mig who have migrated have encountered this and have now are very excited to be able to access a Mazar in, in America in their own backyard, right? So on the days of death anniversary, for instance, if you go to the, the Mazar in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, you will see lots and lots of people there. Right, who are there to honor a Sufi saint, who are there to receive Baraka from a Sufi saint, because that is what they know to be part of their Muslim identity that they were they practice back in their homeland, right? So this is one reality of Sufism in the in the American context, right? It's it's shrine cultures. And Bawa's is not the only shrine. There are many more shrines that are developing now because more and more Sufi teachers are passing on and they're being interred in, in America. So we're talking about an actual deeply rooted reality of American Sufism that is tied to land, that is tied to the soil, that is tied to geography, right? And I think that's so important. Um, the, the opposite is, you know, this kind of vast popularization of Rumi, right? We talked about Hafez, we talked about Omar Khayyam, um, we're at a moment now where Rumi has become so popular, right? And again, this is really tied to European Orientalists who encountered Sufi poetry and they translated bits and bits of it and it just started spreading and spreading and disseminating, right? Um, and so one of the things I often tell my students when I'm teaching here in, in at Queens University is that if you ever go to a bookstore, so if you go to maybe Barnes and Nobles, um, our version in Canada would be chapters, I often tell them to go see where Rumi books are placed. Um, go to the religion section and go to the section on Islam and see if there's any Rumi poetry there. Often the case is it's not there. And then I tell them, we'll go to the arts or the poetry section and to see if Rumi is placed there. And often it is. And so why are the books on, you know, Islam in the West? What is wrong with Islam? You know, these kind of popular, really kind of problematic titles on Muslims and Islam in the religion section, but Rumi and Rumi's poetry, which we would think should be also in the Islam section, in the religion section, is in its own separate category. And I think this is so important, right? So this is the other legacy of, of Sufism in kind of the current moment. And this legacy really raises this question of the erasure of Rumi, right? What has happened to Rumi and Rumi's Islam, his Muslimness, and what has happened in terms of him being transmitted to the American context? And what kind of Rumi is popularized, right? So, you know, um, some of you are probably on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, and I don't know what other new things are happening. Maybe Rumi is also on TikTok, I don't know. But if, you know, you go to some of these social media platforms and you see Rumi quotes, and you see, you know, Rumi following, you just see Rumi, Rumi, Rumi. And one of the things I often say is, well, I don't really know if that's a Rumi quote and, and I don't know if it's been translated properly, but people are not thinking about that. They're really like in love with Rumi, right? And so that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? And I think the individual who popularized Rumi um, through his interpretations is Coleman Barks. And, you know, he has numerous books. He's, he's sold them. He has really A-lister friends now. And he himself is actually a Sufi. He is a student of Bawa Muhayyadeen and was encouraged by Bawa to do this translation work. Um, but his books and his books on Rumi have influenced so many people. So Coldplay, for instance, is a huge fan of Rumi. Um, and has Coleman Barks' books and, and his most recent CD um, has Coleman Barks featured on one of the tracks reciting the guest house. Um, you know, there is Rumi perfume, there's Rumi vodka, which again, we could say what's so problematic about that, but 
there it is, right? Um, we don't even have to mention beyond this example, which is that Beyonce named one of her twins Rumi after reading some Rumi poems, right? So we are talking about a reality that Rumi is just popular, right? Um, a few years ago, there was a huge controversy that um, they were going to make a Rumi bio epic. I think the director of Gladiator was going to do it and they were going to do a story on Rumi and they were thinking about casting and they decided to cast, I think, Leonardo DiCaprio. I don't think it's happening anymore. But that again, Twitter just went wild, right? And again, raising this deep question of cultural appropriation, how is a white person playing Rumi? Rumi wasn't white and how is this possible, right? There's tourism to, to Turkey, which is one of the largest kind of tourism industries. People wanna go see whirling dervishes, a tradition that is affiliated with it. And so again, I think all of this is signaling to this idea of how Rumi is presented and kind of his universalism, his love, and that is kind of taken out of the context from his Islam and his understanding of the Prophet Muhammad. And I think this fissure is, is really harmful and I think painful for many people. And I think it's painful in light of our current moment where Islamophobia is rampant and there's um, you know, anti-Muslim hostility. How do you have someone like Rumi who's the best-selling poet um, that is beloved and on Amazon best time, you know, top sellers is on New York Times, but at the same time that Muslims are structurally systematically being harmed or killed um, or um, there are attacks against Muslims and Muslim bodies, right? How do you reconcile this, right? Um, and I think this is also something that's um, a legacy that's been picked up by the Ismaili community. So, and I'll kind of end up on this note is that one of the things that I'm doing in terms of my project right now is thinking about um, Rumi and Sufism in Canada. And one of the places that a lot of kind of presentations of uh, the Sama, the, the whirling dervish of um, presentations are actually taking place in spaces like the Aha Khan Museum or the Smiley Center in the social hall. Um, and so yearly for Rumi's death anniversary or for his birthday in September, whirling dervishes, um, you know, present the, the tradition of whirling in, in Ismaili spaces, right? And I think, again, this is presenting kind of interesting ways in which this tradition is cutting into different spaces that are popular or not popular. And I think it, it's you know, also raising really lots of questions in terms of you know, how do we talk about the diversity of Sufism from the Arabian Peninsula to North, uh, North America? How do we talk about issues of self-orientalism, especially if you're um, someone who comes from the Muslim tradition and are interested in Rumi and Sufism? How do we talk about Muslim traditions and also center Sufism? Um, and do Muslims own Sufism, right? Like how do we reconcile and deal with the fact that in American context, one of the reality is that Sufism has existed um, amongst non-Muslims as well. And there's a long history of it. Um, so this has been quite a lot of information in a very short amount of time, um, but hopefully that's something that um, will get some conversations or some questions for you all. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, but yeah. Thank you so much. That was, I have a lot of notes here because I couldn't stop taking notes. That was fantastic. And I'm sure um, the, the audience members feel the same way. Um, so thank you for, I think, sharing this history with us in a really, it, to me, it felt like I could follow along and I personally could see a lot of connections to some of the things that I've come across just in, in being Ismaili myself. There, there were certain things that kind of resonated um, with the, you know, being sort of the minority, not always knowing how to answer some of those questions, especially your last slide there, I was um, chatting with a friend and said, I feel like we could replace some of these words and it would be the same exact question and it would still be something that, you know, at least I feel comfortable saying I grapple with. Um, so, so thank you for that and just for being so honest with us. In terms of some of the questions that have come in and um, for everyone, please do share them in. We'll do our best uh, to, to get to as many as we can. Um, I think there was one that came in really early on that was more for understanding is, is there meaning to the term dervish? Um, so I think in, in, um, in Sufi context, the dervish could be 
anybody who like historically was referred to somebody who was like a, a mendicant, like an aesthetic individual. Um, in the context of let's say particular Sufi orders, like in the Mevlavi order in, in Turkey, um, which is based on the tradition of um, Rumi, a dervish might mean something similar to like a murid, like a student of a, of a past, right? So if there's a, a murshid, like a teacher, and then there's a murid, and that could be a version of a dervish. But again, usually um, it's similar to fakir, so someone who's an aesthetic antinomian figure who perhaps, you know, wandered quite a bit and maybe didn't have their own home. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I actually, I didn't know that either. So I'm glad that someone asked. Um, thank you for, for that response. Um, there's another one that came in about uh, Orientalism as a concept as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that this idea of that it focuses mainly on the West perspective of the East in acknowledging only Asia mm -hmm. um, and that it seems to also ignore Africa. And I think the I, I might expand on the question that came in to also think about, you know, what does it mean when we're talking about Western perceptions and even modernity that sort of is the counter to Orientalism, if, if you could expand a little bit on, on some of that? Um, so I may need you to say some more, but I think, um, so in, in this presentation, I think I was thinking about Orientalism in, in some way, in ways of how Europeans who, um, uh, colonized places like, you know, India, Africa, what we think about as the Middle East, but didn't obviously exist as a Middle East, and um, kind of colonized and took over. And in that process had particular stereotypes of the communities that they had taken over, which also included parts of Asia. So a lot of these stereotypes of spirituality, but also backwardness and not like regressive and like barbaric were stereotypes that were given to people who were racialized. They were given to, let's say, people who practiced Buddhism in, in Asia or had, you know, Confucianism or Hinduism. Right. So anything that was not Christianity was kind of presented in particular binary ways. Um, and anything that was Christianity was seen as the best of the best. Right. Um, and so the lens through which they were looking was a lens of kind of an white, but kind of European Christian Protestant standpoint. And they were kind of judging and everything was um, was backwards. And so I think that's what's interesting is that Islam was seen as something that was uh, violent and, you know, Prophet Muhammad was the Antichrist because he wasn't like Jesus and you know all of this kind of uh, uh, awful racist stereotypical perceptions but at the same time Sufis then seemed like an anomaly as someone who were like a special group of people that they just were like oh we we like them for these reasons because they dance and they do music and there's these weird dervishes right and, and so they're kind of have an ambiguous place in the ways in which Europeans thought about um, uh, kind of India and, and Persia and the Middle East. And so then that made them alluring, but again, influenced the way that they th thought about Sufism and something that was not Islamic, right? Which you see as something that's continuing today is, is I think what I wanted you to, to get across, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And actually your response made me also think about um, to, that, to that question that came in specifically about not uh, sort, of, sort of ignoring Africa also makes a lot of sense just because of what that sort of that entire country became in terms of the transatlantic slave trade. They had to be dehumanized, which means you can't uh, sort of put them on a pedestal in the same way that, that this, ha this occurred in other spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there is a, uh, a, a question about a book, actually, if, you're, if you've uh, looked through The 40 Rules of Love by uh, Elif Shafak, um, and wanting to know, is, is that an accurate uh, historical fiction? Is it, is, you know, and, and do you have recommendations for Sufi writing that, that folks might be able to turn to if they want to learn more? Yeah, that's a great question. I love 40 Rules of Love. Like, I think it's a beautiful book, um, but it's fiction, right? Um, Ellie Shafik is a, it's a brilliant writer. Um, she is from Turkey and she has, uh, she has a brilliant TED talk, actually, um, that people should look up. And I'm forgetting the name of it, but if you Google her name and then Google TED talk, then it has over a million views. Like, it's like a huge, you know, um, and she again talks about this East, West and Orientalism. But at the same time, I think Ellie Shafik is also, you know, has some Coleman Barks, but also has like Anne-Marie Schimmel and William Chittick as these figures that she cites from. And she has experienced Rumi and the love of Rumi and Shams and has had a creative process with it. And I think that's what's kind of really hard about 
at Rumi, right? Because I speak to some of my poet friends, actually Ismaili poet friends who are spoken word artists, who also kind of go through the process of like, you encounter poetry and poetry moves you and speaks to you. So how do you not have um, your own representation of that through novel or fiction or else otherwise? But at the same time, is it, you know, is it anything beyond that? And does that take away the legitimacy of what she's trying to do, right? Um, that's a really hard one. Um, I will again say I love the book. I think it's a great book. Um, and I, you know, I, I recommend people reading it. But if you're looking for kind of, if you want to get to the text, I know I would recommend uh, translations by people like William Chirik. Um, I could write that down in the chat box. Um, and also individuals like Anne-Marie Schimmel. Um, um, so William Cheddick has a series of translations that are really great um, and I think have some of a similar register. Um, and again, I'm not, I don't wanna put Coleman Barks down, but you know, they're not literal translations, right? I think, you know, I think it's uh, it's different in the sense that he, again, is having an experience of Rumi and is, is interpreting that Rumi for himself coming from his own position. And he's very clear about that. Um, so if, again, as a, I think as a scholar, I want to just be very careful to say that, this, you know, if, if you want the source, you know, go to the text and the literal translation, that's very different. But it doesn't mean that's the only way to encounter it either, right? I think it's just super complicated. But I think that's a great question. And I'll just type in the name of the books here um, for scholars. Thank you. And, and I actually appreciate, um, I had written this down too, this, this idea of encounters with as, as a way to differentiate from things like the, the diasporic movements and, and, and actual sh uh, shifting of peoples, right? Um, whereas the encounters are the things we see on, as you aptly shared, Instagram and TikTok and other places. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that we, we have time for about one more and, and then we'll, uh, we'll have to wrap up for today. But um, there were a couple of questions that just came in, uh, I think maybe wanting a little bit more of uh, your perspective even on the you know, is there a way to, I don't want to say make a decision because I don't think any of us can, um, but reconciling the, if I am sort of engaging in performative actions as, as a Sufi, and, and that's what I'm seeing in a lot of the questions that are in here, um, but I say that I'm not a Muslim, even though I may say that mm -hmm. uh, or may acknowledge it in that way, given the spirituality within Islam as a religion, is it still... Is it still being Muslim, even if I don't care, carry the title and the label? Mm, yeah. <laughs> and I don't, like I, said, I don't know if you can make a decision, but certainly if you have any thoughts on how to unpack that even. Yeah, I think that's such a complicated question. Um, and I often in my interviews, I'm an ethnographer, so I often spend a lot of time with Sufis, Sufi teachers, and I ask them questions like this, right? Um, often their responses are really metaphysical. And I think as Ismailis, you would really appreciate kind of a metaphysical response is, right? Is that your relationship with your murshid or your imam or your teacher is deeply internal and into your heart, right? And so who who is to come and say that if you don't do your, your prayers or if you don't keep your fasting or if you do certain things you're not supposed to do that 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 relationship that should be located in your heart with your with your divine is somehow any less than or not right so there there is like that that metaphysical reality which is internal located in the seat of your soul and is really good between one you and your god and nobody should have any say in that right at the end of the day um and that said the other thing that i often say to students is in any of those moments I would encourage you to really reflect on power and power structure and, and money. I and mean, this is a really weird thing to say after I've just told you to look internal within your heart and find out what that means is that I'm saying money. But you know, if you're in a position where you're thinking about you know, certain practices that are spiritually tied and have a particular significance to you, but you're commodifying it or consuming it, um, you know, one of the ways you can kind of see if there's a power imbalance is that who is taking home the money and are those people historically the ones who have always had that access or are they people who are on the margins, right? And so if you have certain privileges and you evoke those privileges to further build more privileges, but you yourself realize that maybe you have more privilege than you should, but you're still capitalizing at the end of the day, I think then, then that's problematic, right? And so I think that's more like of a decolonial approach, a kind of a critique of popular spirituality and thinking about who are the communities, indigenous communities, black communities, racialized communities, Muslim communities who have always been on the margins. 
if they're not the ones who are taking home the money, but someone who doesn't embody those racialized identities or marginalities is taking home the money, then there is a systematic imbalance there. That is really kind of a perpetuation of historical colonialism and exist in our contemporary moment. So that's that, right? That's like a capitalistic, consumeristic, that responds. But then there's also your heart, right? Like if at the end of the day, it is, it is that love and that intention is there, that's, that's like a different conversation. So I give you the metaphysical, but I also give you the consumerist, non-metaphysical response, yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. And, and I, I suspect it, you know, both have their uh, think different things will resonate with with different folks and, and whoever asked that, you know, will hopefully have gotten um, some insights because that that one came in quite a bit as well in, in different framings. Um, but thank you so much uh, for your just really thoughtful responses and um, putting together such a sort of enlightening is the word that's coming to mind. For a lot. I'm sorry it was a lot, but I just wanted to throw it all out there for you all. Yeah. Uh, but so well done, um, and and I am I am on behalf of of our audience that was able to join us um, as they've been on and off. Just really grateful um, for you taking the time to be here and and for for sharing so much of your knowledge and and experiences with us, um, and and giving us a entry point that doesn't require us picking up a hundred books and trying to engage in this, but really giving us some places to start. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, and for our, uh, our audience, uh, we will be back here same time, same place tomorrow uh, with another session. And this one will actually continue to carry forward this conversation um, with a look at sort of the implications of when East meets West. Uh, we've laid some of the foundations through, through looking at Sufism of um, what sort of transpires in that transition of East meeting West. And so now we'll, we'll be able to kind of think about some of the uh, implications, and I cautiously use the word consequences because I know that's received negatively, but consequences are what they are. It's the outcome of what happens, and so that's where, where we will turn our attention. Um, so we welcome you to join us if you're able to, um, and for everyone else, thank you so much. CPOI participants, we'll see you over in our next session. Have a great rest of your evening and night. Bye.